Thank you. Good morning. Look, I know you're a friendly lot, but just uh, as before we start, just turn to the person next to you, or someone ne- uh, behind you or in front of you, and just say hello, smile at them, and just uh, connect with them. Just do that for a moment for me. Brilliant. Welcome to everybody. My name's Chris, as you uh, heard, and I'm just going to speak for a few moments today. We'll see how that goes. Um, You know, there's so much to be encouraged about at the moment, I think, by what's going on in the church. This church, and actually the church, particularly in the Church of England, where I spend a lot of my time. I was speaking in North Devon yesterday in Barnstable, and there's this powerful movement across the diocese there, to reach out to young people and start new communities and connections with people that have really not happened before. There's, there's Messy Church, you know that, but they're now launching, have you come across Forest Church and Bubble Church? Gosh, I wish I had time to tell you about that. Uh, this Tuesday, I'm with 100 vicars in Stepney in London who are committed to uh, thinking about how to include young people in the life of their church. So that it's, it's just, there's a sense of this, this movement and what's happening. Youthscape, uh, the organization I've been working with for a very long time, uh, we've been working specifically with churches in diocese, uh, not just here in St. Albans, but right around the country who don't have any youth work and want to start it. And this autumn, in fact, next month, we will pass the 400th church that will have started youth ministry from scratch uh, in the church, which is such an amazing milestone. And these churches, they're from all traditions, all backgrounds. There's a real sense of God moving across the church. Uh, And just my final bit of good news, you might have heard already this because it is amazing. For the first time in the new statistics in the Church of England this year, for the first time in 70 years, the number of children and young people in the church has increased. Amen. So that means God is at work, which is relevant to this morning because we're in the book of James. And uh, we're on a journey through this book, which Tim started at the beginning of September and which I think he said will end uh, in November. This is why I'm kind of glad there's only five chapters in James and that we haven't started the book of Romans we would still be here in 2026. Uh, And in a nutshell, this short book of James is about practical discipleship. What does it actually mean to live as a Christian? And to apply it to us here this morning, what does it actually mean to live as a Christian in your street, in your job, in your family, in your world, here in Luton, in all its glory, in 2024? Because that's what we're trying to do, right? Yeah? We're trying to figure out how to be a follower of Jesus right here, right now. Before we get to that, let's just remind ourselves who's writing this letter. James is the brother of Jesus. Let me just stop there because that's quite something to process, isn't it? You know? So remember, Jesus actually had quite a few stepbrothers and sisters. That's children that Mary and Joseph went on to have. So James grows up with Jesus as a brother. Think about that. Children together. Teenagers together. But remember also, James is not one of the 12 disciples. Those who accompany Jesus most closely through his three years of ministry, though confusingly, there are two of the 12 who are also called James. Are you with me still? Well, you won't be in the next moment, because even more confusingly, he's not actually called James. The name is actually slightly mistranslated. It's really Jacob. If you look in the Greek, you'll see that the name of this book is by Jacobos, which translated into Hebrew, Yaakov, or Jacob. But relax, I'm going to keep calling him James so I don't mess with any of our heads. Let's just call him James. It's fine. It's fine. So as I've said, James isn't one of the 12, but he's close to that. 
Jesus appears to James alongside the 12 after his resurrection. And in the weeks and months that follow, and the church establishes itself in Jerusalem, James emerges as the leader of the Jerusalem church. So Acts tells us that Paul heads out and looks at establishing Christian communities right around the ancient world. But James stays in Jerusalem and focuses on leading the church there. So he's a significant figure. In Galatians, Paul talks about the three people who are pillars of the church. Peter, John, and... That was pretty obvious, wasn't it? But well done anyway. And leading the church in Jerusalem is not easy. In fact, it proves to be an incredible challenge. There's intense persecution. Remember, if you read this in Acts, it says a great persecution breaks out. That means many believers flee for their lives from Jerusalem. Many who stay behind are in prison, some are killed. And we know from historical writing, there's a terrible famine soon after this in in Jerusalem as well. And if that wasn't enough, there were huge controversies about what a Jew becoming a Christian would and wouldn't do. How much of their Jewish faith and tradition would they leave behind when they became a Christian? So, Peter, uh, so, so sorry, James is leading the church in Jerusalem through tough times. And then he writes this letter, not to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem because he's seeing them every day. He writes this letter to Jewish Christians outside Jerusalem, spread around the Roman Empire. Remember, he starts the letter with the rather poetic, to the 12 tribes scattered across the nations. So he's particularly addressing Jews around the ancient world who've become Christians. So let's just talk about the book itself. I thought it'd be helpful to do some of this before we land in. Relax, I'm absolutely going to be under two hours today. That was a joke, and you laughed very nervously. So let's talk about the book itself. So it's kind of a summary of the key teachings that James thinks are important about living as a Christian. He doesn't develop one idea in a linear way. In fact, there's 12 key discipleship lessons in the book, and each of them sort of stands alone and concludes with a catchy one-liner. But they're all connected through key repeated words and themes. It's actually quite a modern way of writing. He's trying to sort of catch people's attention, especially his use of one-liners. I think if he was writing today, he would probably be publishing through Instagram stories uh, rather rather than a book. The other thing you can see is how much James has been influenced by two bodies of teaching. The Sermon on the Mount has clearly had a huge impact on him, and it weaves its way through a lot of what he says, and the book of Proverbs too, which is why I think he loves these little short quips and one-liners, like today's reading, faith without actions is dead. Uh, And then later, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and, and effective, and resist the devil and he will flee from you. These are really catchy one-liners, kind of proverb style. You could basically create a series of t-shirts, I've decided, based on James. He's really good at this, and it's memorable, which is, uh, which is why I think he's doing it. And there are themes that James comes back to again and again that help us think about genuine faith. We've already covered some of them, and they're rich and they're deep. He talks about favoritism, about how we tend to show love to people we like or people like us. He talks about how we speak and the use of our tongue, a theme he returns to several times. And he talks about words and actions, which is what we're looking at this morning. Honestly, I am getting there. And of course, he also talks about how facing suffering or difficulties is often the way that we develop a deeper Christian faith. So let's talk about the verses we'll looking at this morning. And I'm just going to focus actually particularly on the first two verses in the in the short time we have. They sort of sum up the point that he makes in other parts of the book. But this is one of those cool moments when he pulls it together in a really memorable way. Those first two verses, he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? 
Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by action, by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. He's good at these one-liners. It's dramatic. James isn't saying, just to be clear, that you become a Christian through your actions. He's not contradicting Paul when he says that we're saved by faith. But he says that your actions are a really good indication of whether you found faith and are living it out. He's saying if there are no actions to accompany your pronounced faith, then maybe your faith isn't real. And he gives one example of an action. I think it's really interesting to see what he chooses. I mean, what one action would you choose if you were writing this book to show that your faith is real? You pray all the time. You're at church all the time. You don't swear. You're a good worker. You treat your kids nicely. I don't know. What would you choose? James, James chooses something different as an example, and I don't think it's an accident. He talks about serving the poor. So often in Scripture, it talks about how we treat the poor, and this is no exception. God's focus again and again seems to be on the poor, the powerless, the voiceless, those whose dignity has been denied, the easily despised, the readily left out, the demonized, the disposable. And this is what James picks up on. In fact, he conjures up a picture of someone in need, someone really in need, your brother and sister. But remember that Jesus says, everyone are your brothers and sisters. But the Christian just prays for them. That's what they say, right? Go in peace, keep warm and well fed. That's a prayer. They pray for them, but they do nothing for them. And James says, if that's how you live, your faith is dead. Think about how many times we pray together in services on our own, whatever, for the poor, for those in need, and I and we do nothing else. We don't actually do anything about their physical needs. I know that's actually often how I've lived. And James doesn't mince his words. He says that if you do that in prayers every Sunday or whenever, but the church doesn't do anything about it, your faith is dead. That's why this is such a powerful image this morning. These gifts that will go to the food bank. And I suspect James would be thrilled at that. But he'd probably also remind us that once a year is not enough. Right? Suddenly this feels very close at home. Remember the parable Jesus tells about the rich man and Lazarus. I don't know whether you know this. Um, it's a complicated parable because it's a story of a rich man who parties to excess while this beggar is at his gate day after day. And after death, the rich man is in some kind of purgatory. I told you this was a theologically complicated parable. And he can see the beggar receiving relief from God, but it's too late. I asked a group of Christians just recently who they thought they as Christians were in the parable. And they sort of said, they were slightly uncertain. They said, are we, are we the beggar? No, sadly not. We are the rich man in this parable. Jesus isn't telling the parable to feel like we're being made to badly, be badly treated by the world. He's challenging our indifference at the poor. And here, James is following that right up with a sort of Instagrammable strapline. If you do nothing to help the poor, your faith is dead. I have a real regret about something we did, or in fact didn't do at Youthscape. That's the youth organization that I'm part of. And I, I thought I just would say a little bit about it this morning, because I feel actually really ashamed. Over the last four or five years in Luton, there have been a huge influx of refugees, and they've been crammed into the very worst conditions in hotels, unable to work, children having to go to school and learn a new language at the same time. And we've been really conscious of young people in particular who've come through the most traumatic journeys and are traumatized and broken. And we've been praying for them 
and talking about them as a trust and meaning to do more for them. But the truth is, in all the busyness of our existing projects and all the work we do in schools, we've never actually got further than praying for them. And I know that's wrong. Not that we didn't, shouldn't pray for them, but that we stopped at that point. And I know we can't use that excuse going forward. What James is telling us is that faith isn't real because we're nice or avid Bible readers or listen to lots of worship music on YouTube or even spend hours in prayer. Faith is real because we as a church get our hands dirty in the world around us. And James does not mince his words. He doesn't say faith without works is less good or not as useful. He says it's dead. Ah! So these two verses are really memorable. Mission achieved, James. But they're also piercing. They have relevance to my life and yours. Remember James' warning earlier in this book, which Tim took us through a couple of weeks ago. Christians can't show favoritism in who they help. We don't just look after the people who look like us or sound like us. We serve wherever this God of ours leads us. And that is why we have something that we, that is why we have to do this together as a church. Because it's difficult. Don't buy the t-shirt. Live the life that James challenges us to. You know, James was martyred in Jerusalem not long after he wrote this letter, killed for his belief that this was the truth. I'm so glad he left us this letter, as challenging as it is to read. So here we are, and it's 2024, and we're working out how to be followers of Jesus here in Luton. But these words of James and this challenge feels as real and relevant as ever. And I know James will be challenging us as we read it together. Don't just study this stuff in a sermon series. Don't just discuss it in small groups. He'd borrow a, another famous phrase from a well-known brand of sports shoes. He'd say, just do it. Amen. Amen.